The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If you're inclined to root for the home team, we've got a little fun and games for you tonight. First, with Jeopardy! champ Matea Roach, Canada's most successful contender of all time. Then, some World Cup perspective from Soccernomics co-author Simon Cooper, as Canada took to the field for the first time in decades. And, in a much more serious vein, we'll find out why a new report is sounding the alarm about the sustainability of Canada's healthcare system. It's Wednesday, November 23rd, and that's all ahead on the agenda. Her 23-game winning streak on Jeopardy! earlier this year kept viewers across the country on the edge of their seats. It also landed her a spot in this year's Tournament of Champions, which just wrapped. Matea Roach, a University of Toronto grad and resident of Ontario's capital city, is now host of the Canada Land Politics podcast, The Back Bench. And she joins us now here in studio. So great to meet you. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Congratulations. I mean, you had a hell of a run. <laughs> yeah, I sure did. You had the best run of any Canadian ever. Except for Alex Trebek, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, shall we show some of your work? Sure. Sheldon, if you would, the clip. You are now a five-day champion with a total of $117,200. Matea, what is the Netherlands? Yes. Who is Shackleton? Yes, Ernest Shackleton. Who's Usain Bolt? Right. You don't seem too flummoxed by different categories like classical music, philosophy. I, there's only so many things that are going to be asked about on Jeopardy. Like, I feel like I have a good general knowledge of many things except for sports. <laughs> a 12-day total of $271,282. Matea Roach, it has been a pleasure pleasure watching you play the game. You finish your remarkable streak in the top five all time for both longest Jeopardy streaks and most money won. Congratulations to you and we will Thank see you, you in so the much. tournament champions. Pretty cool, Matea. Let's start with this. How do you know so much stuff? Um, mostly by accident, I would say. I'm, I've always had, I would call it, a very sticky memory. So I haven't had to go out of my way to memorize things. Um, I think in one of those interviews that we showed a clip from uh, with Ken from the show, I later said that I bought a bunch of flashcards to prepare for the show and then didn't actually write anything on them or use them at all because I just felt overwhelmed at how you could possibly condense all the knowledge that Jeopardy might ask about into, you know, a set of a couple hundred flashcards. Mm. So I think... Really, how I know so much stuff is I've always been pretty curious. I've always wanted to read a lot, and I think I'm a good listener and retain a lot from what I hear and what I read. So eventually, all of that you know, has to come in handy somewhere, and for me, it came in handy on television. Ken being Ken Jennings, who's, who's still number one all time? Yeah, oh yeah. I don't know that Ken Jennings' record is ever going to be beaten. So the 74 games is just so far beyond what anybody, even in the past year of ridiculous long streaks on the show, has mm -hmm. been able to accomplish. So yeah, he's... Well, he won the greatest of all time tournament, so, you know, mm. he's the GOAT. You guys bonded? Um, you don't actually get to see the host a lot uh, during the show because of compliance law. Um, anyone who has access to the game material can't really socialize with the contestants because it could raise questions of the integrity of the show, and it's actually really strictly regulated. So you do get to know the host a little bit over the course of taping many episodes if you're there, you know, as I was over the course of what was a month on television. But mm. uh, my interactions with Ken most of them have been televised. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, uh, let's talk about how competitive this game is. And to that end, you, you, you lost in the semifinals, I gather, to Amy Schneider. Is that her name? Uh, so, no. I actually lost in the semifinals to Andrew He, who then later went on to play against Amy in the finals. Oh, okay. Okay. But you you had an exhibition game against her? Yes, that's In which correct. you defeated her? Th that is true, yeah. Okay. So... This is a crazy competitive game to play, is it not? Absolutely, especially at the tournament level where everyone has proven themselves already as a champion. Everyone who was there had played in a minimum of four games, you know, up to a maximum of Amy's 40 wins and then, you know, one final game. So there were really no givens in this tournament. It felt like with the right board, with the right sort of set of circumstances on the day, anybody probably could have beaten anybody else. Hmm. Anybody can beat anybody else because everybody's that good. Yeah, that's what I believe. I think hmm. there were certainly certain players that had an edge either in terms of they were more experienced with the game or their depth of knowledge is just greater. You know, like Amy, I think in particular, is remarkable for how broad her knowledge really is. 
Um, but I think, again, there's so much luck in this game, right? You know, you get your, your 61 clues in the game, and if there happen to be some categories that you like that maybe the other players don't like so much, it could be your day, even if your opposition is really strong. You were very lucky in one Final Jeopardy to have, <laughs> to have the answer well, they give you the answer, and you have to come up with a question. And the question was? Uh, the question was, what is O Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as soon as that question, as soon as the, the, uh, the answer came up, what was going through your head at that moment? Honestly, um, I was just glad that I already had a runaway game at that point. So the, the outcome of Final Jeopardy didn't really matter for me winning or losing right. the game. You were so I, far ahead, you couldn't lose. Yeah, exactly, unless I'd made a really foolish wager. Yeah. Um, but I felt glad that the outcome was sort of already determined because, you know, there's always conspiracy theorists online who like to say things like, oh, well, this, this category was planted for this person or this Final Jeopardy, mm. well, they had an advantage. Um, and of course, me being the only Canadian contestant in that game, um, it would be a pretty dire indictment of my education and specifically my education in <laughs> French if I hadn't been able to <laughs> To, to get that clue because it was referencing uh, lyrics from the French version of O Canada. Um, but, you know, as I think Ken Jennings actually noted before revealing my answer, they, they set these, they write these clues like ages in advance of when they know who's going to be playing the game. And even on the day, the order in which the game boards are played is randomized, right? So they don't say, well, this is going to be our Monday show or Tuesday show because they're taping five shows a day. They pull randomly which game board's going to be used. So I remember just thinking, okay, I'm glad I already have this one in the bag and it doesn't really matter. <laughs> now, as much as you caught a break with that one, because obviously a Canadian kid ought to know the lyrics to O Canada, even in French, there was another show where somebody from Atlanta was one of your opponents, and the answer was the two names of the Atlanta airport. Yes. <laughs> That's a tough one. That was a tough one. And it was one of those things where, um, and so that was actually the game that I lost during my original streak. Um, and it was one of those things where as soon as I saw Danielle, the player who beat me, when her answer was revealed, I knew, ah, oh, geez, like, that's right. Uh, the clue was something to do with, it was, you know, the two names attached to a facility that was at a former racetrack that had once been owned by someone who had been a Coca-Cola magnate, I think a former CEO or perhaps even the founder of Coca-Cola. I don't remember exactly who it was. Um, and so I knew it had to be something in Atlanta, but I just couldn't really get to what the facility would be. I heard racetrack and I started thinking horses. Mm. Um, but of course, a racetrack could also be an automobile racetrack, which I think perhaps is what was operative here. I'm not really actually sure. I should have looked up the history of the airport afterwards. Okay, so here's, here's my question to you now. Mm. Do you remember what the proper question is? Oh, it was what is Hartsfield and Jackson. Okay, you got I'm it now. I'm never going to forget that. Yeah. <laughs> you got it now. Uh, let's, uh, Sheldon, top of page two. Let's show this picture. Two of the goats, and by that I mean this is sports terminology, greatest of all time, Ken Jennings, Amy Schneider, after she won the Tournament of Champions, um, I want to know what's going through your mind as you look at the two of them together. So I, it was such a nice moment. The whole taping of the Tournament of Champions was just incredible. And all of the contestants that were competing in the final, I think I would have been perfectly happy to see them win. You know, Andrew, the fact that he had beaten me in the semifinals, I always love to lose to the best, so I would have been happy with him winning. And Sam Buttry, who was the Professor's Tournament champion and then made it to the finals, is just so likable. Um, he just is so charismatic, and so he would have been a fantastic winner. But so for me, um, seeing Amy win, what people I think sometimes forget at home is that Jeopardy is taped quite far in advance of when it actually airs. It mm. tapes somewhere between six to ten weeks, typically, um, at least in my experience, uh, in advance of when the shows air. And so when I was preparing to tape my initial run of shows in January of this year, Amy's run was airing. And it was actually to the point that I thought she was doing so well, I thought she might still be there <laughs> playing <laughs> when I went to go tape. Um, and then, of course, she wasn't. And it actually turned out that her final game aired the night before I taped my first four shows. And so I've always felt that my run was in some way kind of connected to hers. I feel like getting to watch her play the game so well as I was preparing um, really made me feel inspired and made me feel that, you know, as two queer women, maybe we could both excel at the game. And then obviously that ended up happening for me kind of in a way that was so far beyond what I had ever expected. <laughs> hmm. Now, do I have this right? You won four straight games before telling your parents? Yes, well, so they tape up to five, yeah, five shows in a day typically. Um, and so I taped those four games all on the same day. Um, and you don't get to use your phone when you're at the set because again, there's integrity issues, right? And so since my parents, uh, due to COVID restrictions with who could be on set, 
hadn't been able to come actually watch the taping, uh, they didn't know. And in fact, I wasn't planning on telling my parents at all about my streak because I didn't want to put the pressure on them of not being able to tell anybody else. But then I realized I'm still on their phone plan and <laughs> I was going to get more roaming charges because I had to make a return trip to Los Angeles to continue <laughs> taping. And I thought, my mom's pretty eagle-eyed. Like, she's going to notice that these roaming charges are not adding up to the amount of days that I said I was going to be in Los Angeles. Uh, so that was actually the only reason I told my parents. And then I was glad in the end because it meant that I was able to kind of lean on them a little bit for support as I was going through the experience of having the show's air. Whereas if they didn't know how big it was going to be, they would have been like, why is Matea all worked up about, you know, <laughs> being on television for two days? Like, what's going on? Yeah, it got, uh, this just in, it got big. It, yeah. <laughs> it did get big. You said that being on Jeopardy is kind of the closest thing you've ever experienced to an out-of-body experience. What'd that mean? So what that means is that there's just so much going on when you're in the studio. There is, and you know, you have to consider that most people that are competing on Jeopardy, unless it's the celebrity version of the show, are not used to being in front of a camera, being in a television studio, right? So there's lights, there's music, there's crew members bustling all around. And, you know, for a lot of people that have been longtime fans of the show, it's you're almost going to, like, hallowed ground, right? You're going to a place that you've maybe watched on television every night, in some cases for decades. And so... That can all be very overwhelming and overstimulating. And so what I found was that when I was playing the game, I didn't really form that many memories of what were the clues and the categories uh, that I actually had been dealing with. Because it's sort of like as soon as one clue comes up on the screen, if you ring in or if you don't ring in, you have to put it out of your mind because you need to focus on the next thing ahead of you. And so I found many times when I was watching my run, um, there were things that I was ringing in on that I completely didn't remember ringing in on at all. <laughs> hmm. Yours, I mean, we've had other people on the program, and I think actually you saw, we did a program um, many moons ago about some of the contestants on Jeopardy. And there's all sorts of different approaches, right? Either go very aggressive mm -hmm. or be sort of cautious about how quickly you want to ring in. Did you have an approach that you always followed? So my approach during my original run, I didn't really have that great of an idea of how well I was going to do. Some people prepare and they have all these analytics and they know what, you know, what percentage of daily doubles they're going to get correct roughly over, you know, a span of 100 games or something like that. How many could they expect? I didn't have any real barometer for how well I was going to do. And so for me, I was trying to minimize losses as opposed to maximizing gains, which would be the more aggressive approach. And so during my original run on the show, I was playing all the categories from the lowest value clue up to the highest value. I would typically play all the clues in a category in a row if I could. Um, you know, obviously you don't have full control of the board the whole time, but that was my approach. And my daily double wagers were pretty small, generally speaking, because I didn't want to have that demoralizing hit of maybe you lose like $10,000 or something like that, and then you might even be behind. Um, of course, that also means you're giving up on opportunities to really build an advantage, right? Because that's where you see typically when players have really, really high scores, it's often because they have really capitalized on those daily doubles in some way. Um, when I went back to do the tournament, I knew that there were going to be some really aggressive players in the field. And so although in my semifinal, I didn't really have as much control of the board as I would have wanted to and didn't ring in on as many clues as I would have liked to, you can see that I'm selecting more from the higher value clues, mm -hmm. starting in maybe the row of the 800 in, in the Jeopardy round or 1600 in the double Jeopardy round. Um, and if I'd had the opportunity to make any wagers, I would have made much bigger wagers. But Andrew really cleaned up. He got all three daily doubles in our semifinal mm -hmm. game. Uh, Final Jeopardy, what percentage of the Final Jeopardy clues do you think you knew the answer to? Mm, or the so, question to, I should say. Yeah, so, I mean, in my original run, I, I know the statistic for that, that I got about just over 70, I think is kind of 70 or 71 is what it rounded to, 71% of the Final Jeopardy clues. That's amazing. Over 24. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure... Because they're the worst, right? They're the worst <laughs> questions. They really are. Well, they're designed to be tougher, right? Because yeah. they you are given that 30 <laughs> seconds, and so they, they don't want the questions uh, to be something you can come to super, super easily. Mm. Sometimes you do have that moment, like the Okanda clue for me, of course, was a slam dunk and there were a couple of other times where I started writing down my response even before Ken had finished reading the clue because you can see it up on a monitor and so if you're reading ahead and you know the answer right away you can just get it down there and you don't have to worry about running out of time. Um, the tournament 
Champions clues were definitely tougher. I mean, in my exhibition match, I knew that final Jeopardy, but then in my semifinal, I didn't know that one. I would say I maybe knew about 50% of them over the course of the entire tournament. Maybe we'll call it 50% plus one. There might be, you know, a That's slight margin above. still a shockingly high percentage. I know when I play the game on TV, I would always bet zero on final Jeopardy because I never know the answer. It's too tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is hard. I think the thing that you have to realize about the final Jeopardy clues is that often there are a couple of different pieces that you need to seize on in order to get to the right answers. So, you know, for instance, the Atlanta clue that we were talking about earlier, there was the piece about the racetrack, there was the piece about Coca-Cola, and it's like a puzzle that you have to put together, right? More so than some of the clues in the regular game, uh, you know, when you're going down the 60 clues on the board are a little bit more straightforward, where they're directly asking you for the capital of a certain country, and it's just you have to pull that fact. Uh, so even the O Canada clue, you know, for me was really easy, but if you're an American and maybe don't know the lyrics, you might think, okay, it's mentioning the French version. So what's a country that would have a French version of its anthem as opposed to, you know, France, where it would just be in French? Mm -hmm. Well, Canada is one of the most well-known countries that has, you know, French-English bilingualism. I think Cameroon's, like, maybe the only other one. Um, I don't think anyone's pulling Cameroon in 30 seconds, right? They're probably <laughs> going to go towards Canada. Uh, okay. I got to ask you about... Uh, well, I should... I... My assumption is that when you eventually lost, it was a heartbreaking moment. Although when I watched you on television doing it, I mean, you're, you're doing all the right things. You're applauding like a, like a very classy person for the person who eventually defeated you. How much did you lose by? One dollar. <laughs> One dollar. How often do you wake up in the middle of the night saying to yourself, Damn it all, one dollar. You know what, I wake up in the middle of the night a lot, never about that. It's always just like, <laughs> oh, the heat in my house is on too hot or something like that. Um, no, I was very at ease, genuinely, when I lost. Because first of all, I think it would be a little bit silly, I felt like it would be a little bit silly to be too upset about losing when I'd already won more games of Jeopardy than almost anybody else around, you know, mm -hmm. I... And how much money? Uh, 560,000 American... Not bad. American dollars. Not bad. No, not yeah. too bad, right? Certainly much more money than I'd ever seen before in my life. So, you know, my circumstances all told were pretty good. It's not like they said, okay, you lost uh, and we're going to take all the money to you and you, you don't get to have that moment, right? Um, but the other thing was that uh, Danielle, who beat me in that game, played strategically really well. The reason why she beat me by a dollar is because she did her math exactly right to figure out how much I was going to wager and she knew she could only win if I was wrong. So that's why the math ended up working out the way it did. She knew, okay, well, this is probably what Matea's going to wager if she's wrong. I want to wager to beat her by a dollar. And that's exactly what ended up happening. So, How did she know how much you were going to wager? Well, so if you're a student of the game of Jeopardy, you notice that there are certain kind of common strategies that people will use in Final Jeopardy wagering. And so in my case, I was the leading player. And what I did every time that I was in the lead and didn't have a runaway game, which is where you have more than twice the second place player's score, right. is that I would always wager so that if I were correct, I would have exactly twice their score uh, plus a dollar. Hmm. And so Danielle, I actually don't think she saw me wager in that manner that day. Like, I think I'd had, or no, she had. There was a game where she'd seen me do that. But she also, I think, just got kind of the impression that I was the sort of person that knew the game well enough, I'd been there for long enough, that that was probably what I was going to do. And so knowing that she had no chance of winning if I was correct, she thought, well, what's kind of the lowest risk thing that I can do to win if Matea is wrong? And so that was how she knew. It's not like I told her, hey, Danielle, this is how I'm no, going to bet. No, for sure, for sure. Um, but she was able to read the game and read me to know that that was probably what I was going to do. Do you replay that final Jeopardy moment in your head over and over and over and over and over? <laughs> I try not to. I mean, I think the, the thing that I actually feel a little bit more regretful about is that I had a daily double in that game that if I'd been more aggressive on it, I might have had a runaway and then it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. That's actually the thing I kick myself about a little bit more. But... You know, it was a hard final Jeopardy clue. Um, and again, I, I think it's, you can't really dwell on these things too much, right? I think you just kind of have to move forward. In my case, I had the tournament to look forward to. I knew it wasn't like I'd bombed my only chance to play the game, right? right. Um, so that I think also made getting over that final Jeopardy a little bit easier. Which categories did you like the best? Ah, so I really liked um, geography, generally speaking, I think I was pretty good at, unless it was too US specific and then it gets to be a little bit, um, you know, I feel like the American players have a bit of an advantage there, but world geography was good. Anything to do with history, like there, I, there was a world leaders category at one point that I quite enjoyed in the regular season and then actually again in my semifinal, but I kept getting beaten on the buzzer. Um, 
Yeah, and then I, music stuff tends to be pretty good for me as well, just because it's not a strong suit for a huge amount of Japanese players. Like, I find a lot of players that are really good have said that they don't do as well on music. For me, I think my music knowledge is, like, good enough that it sometimes gives me a little bit of an advantage. So, yeah. Now, you live in a city which has a National Hockey League team, a Canadian <laughs> Football League team, a National Basketball Association team, a Major League Baseball team, a Major League Soccer team. Not to mention all the college and university sports teams that we have in this city. And you know nothing about sports. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> I'll defend myself a little bit. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I know nothing about sports. Um, but my sports knowledge is pretty weak. I think the reason why I say I have weak sports knowledge is because people who know sports really know sports. Like, if, if you're going to describe yourself as a sports fan or as someone who's deep in on sports trivia, you really have to know your stuff. And people do. They get so into it. There's so many statistics. There's a lot of history. For me, um, I don't have cable television. I don't have a way of watching all of these teams. And there's just so much of it that I find it's, like, overwhelming. Mm. Um, I have some knowledge of a couple of things in sports. I used to be a really big cycling fan. So I know, you know, if there was ever a pro cycling category on Jeopardy, I think I would do pretty okay. Um, and the Olympics is something that I typically follow. So sort of like Olympic history, I know a little bit about that. But the conventional, you know, the big four sports leagues, I think I got in on a clue about what was Alex Ovechkin's team at one point during my run, and I felt pretty happy to get one hockey clue. And the answer is? Uh, the Washington Capitals. Very good. I was like, the Nationals is the baseball team. I don't want to muck that up. Well, <laughs> since, since you're on a roll here, okay, I know I could beat you at Jeopardy as long as every question was about sports. And you would. You absolutely would. <laughs> uh, so here we go. Shall we try? Let's try. OK. He's the all-time NHL leader in wins for goaltender. And may I remind you, Mateo, please form your answer in the form of a question. He's the all-time NHL leader in wins for a goaltender. In wins for a goaltender? Yes. Oh. He's from Quebec. From? Played for the New Jersey Devils. Played for, is it, uh, who is Martin Brodeur? Awesome. Well done. I wouldn't done. have gotten it without the hints, but that, awesome. that took me there. Okay. He is the all-time strikeout king in Major League Baseball. <sighs> Nicknamed the Texas Express. It throw over 100 miles an it, hour back Nolan in the day. Who is Nolan Ryan? Yes! Fantastic. I'm deeply impressed. I was okay. reading his Wikipedia article the other One day. One more. <laughs> They've won more great cups than any other team in CFL history. I'm going to say, who are the Argonauts? You are brilliant. All right. Even goodness. the sports questions you're <laughs> nailing here today. Well you, done. You threw me a bit of a, a, <laughs> a bone with some of those hints, but I'm glad to show I don't know nothing about sports. Yes, that's great. Okay, I want to ask you one last question about politics, because, of course, that's your avocation now. You're the new host for the um, Backbench, the podcast on Canada Land. You were... What was this once upon a time? You, you like you did something on Parliament Hill once upon a time, right? I did, yeah. So I was actually uh, a tour guide for the Library of Parliament. So the summer after my first year of university, um, I moved to Ottawa. I'd never even been there before, actually. So I moved to Ottawa kind of sight unseen to take this job mm. as a tour guide because I thought it was such a great opportunity. And I had a fantastic time. I think summer 16 was a, a good time to be in Ottawa. It was sort of exciting. There was a lot going on on the Hill. And I got so, to work with... Uh, with? Well, just a fantastic team of other guides, right? Oh, I thought all you were going to mention some politicians. No, although I did. I had some run-ins with some politicians on the Hill, which was cool. I saw Jeff Regan around a couple times, Harjit Sajjan, Elizabeth May, some other names that I'm probably forgetting. But um, no, the team of other guides that you get to work with, I think, was really the highlight. Because everybody was a university student. I think I was the baby of the group because I was 17. And I think the oldest of us was maybe 23, Sweet. which now feels, you know, a normal age, but at the time seemed a bit old. <laughs> well, let me ask you the question everybody is thinking right now, which is, can you ever imagine running for politics someday? Uh, and I know that this is what everyone says, but I will say absolutely not. <laughs> How come? Um, I don't, you know, being a public figure has been a bit of a, it's been an interesting transition for me, and it's not something that I necessarily would have chosen. Um, Jeopardy sort of chose me, and I thought I was going to go play one game, and that was going to be it, and no one would really hear tell of me after that. So I think that as a politician, of course, you're under such scrutiny, um, you know, not only for the decisions that you make in leadership, but also in some cases for things that you do outside of your work. And I'm not sure that that's something I want to really lean into. Um, I think I want to, you know, keep a close eye on politics. If I'm able to continue working maybe in journalism, media, whatever, I think that would be a great delight for me. But I don't see myself running for office. I see some of my college friends running for office. Got it. Well, it's been a great delight for me to have you here on this set and to meet you and to be able to congratulate you for being just one of the goats. And that, of course, is a sports term for mm -hmm. greatest of all time. Matea Roach, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me.
It's called The Beautiful Game. And for the first time since the mid-1980s, Canada is playing in its preeminent contest, the World Cup. Simon Cooper is a columnist with the Financial Times who's written extensively on soccer. He is co-author with Stefan Zemanski of the newly reissued World Cup edition of Soccernomics, why European men and American women win and billionaire owners are destined to lose. And Simon Cooper joins us now from Paris, France, home of Allez les Bleus. Bonsoir, monsieur. Comment allez-vous? Très bien, merci. Excellent. I think we're going to switch to English now, though, Simon, if that's okay with you. Let's do a quote from the book here to get started. Soccer, you write, is not merely a small business. It has also historically been a bad one. Until very recently, and to some degree still today, anyone who spent any time inside soccer soon discovered that just as oil was part of the oil business, stupidity was part of the soccer business. Okay, let's dive into that. How did you come to the conclusion that soccer is a small and bad business? Well, the small business is just an empirical fact. I mean, the biggest clubs, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Manchester United, have revenues of about a billion dollars a year, which would never get them anywhere near the S&P 500. Usually, uh, clubs just make losses. Manchester United is a very rare example of a profitable club. So these are mid-sized businesses. They're often very badly run by heirs, as a vanity project, by billionaires and oligarchs. And for almost all of its history, soccer clubs have lost money. And people come in thinking they're going to run it like a business and exit a few years later, having failed either to make money or win trophies. So hence, small, bad business, we say in the book. Although the glamour surely has to count for something, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, people want to be involved with soccer because it's very glamorous. It gets your attention from people. A lot of people who make money in regular business, what do they want in life? They don't really want so much more money. They want to be loved and respected. So you're a, Brom a Roman Abramovich. You have $50 billion. You buy Chelsea. You know, it's fun. It's a good way to spend the rest of your life. Well, you do write, despite being a, bas a bad business, soccer clubs are safer than the Bank of England. How can that be? Because when they go bankrupt, which sometimes happens, they still survive. You can't get more sustainable than that. I mean, periodically, you know, the bank or somebody will pull the plug on the club. And it's very easy to create the club again, because what is a club really? It's just a name, it's some shirts, it's maybe the stadium. And so you create a new holding company and, hey, presto, a few days later, you're playing with the same shirts in the same stadium in front of the same fans. <laughs> and this has happened dozens of times in the history of English football, for example. Let's make the distinction here between the club game and the international game. And the conventional wisdom always was that the international game was the, I mean, that was the really big deal. Um, there's been a lot of talk, I guess, lately that the club game has caught up and even surpassed the international game. What say you? Club soccer is definitely better at the top end than international soccer. So the best teams in the world, you know, Liverpool, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich and so on, they are better than almost any team, maybe better than any team that we'll see at this World Cup. I think if Real Madrid were entering as, as a team, they would be the runaway favourite. In a national team, you can't buy players for the positions you don't have covered. And above all these teams, the national teams, they play together very rarely, especially with this World Cup. There's only a week of preparation time. So automatisms that the best clubs do. Club soccer at the top is better. Does this, in your view, diminish the aura or significance of the World Cup at all? It does to me a bit. I mean, I've been to every World Cup since 1990, and in the first round, you often find yourself watching very boring, low-level games that sort of between two teams that would not survive in the English Premier League. You know, I remember one of my low points in World Cups 2010, watching Japan, Paraguay, nil-nil, and thinking, why am I here? Why is anyone here? This is just terrible. And so, you know, with 32 teams, maybe half of these teams are deeply mediocre and there's bad soccer, but still it means a lot to people back home. So, you know, if Japan play Paraguay, it means a lot in those two countries, even though this is very far from being the best soccer in the world. Uh, I'd like your view on how far you think Major League Soccer in North America has come. I know here in Toronto, for example, we've got a team, Toronto FC, that routinely gets really good crowds. Uh, twice as big, in fact, as the Canadian Football League team that has uh, a 100-year head start on it. How good do you think the quality of soccer is in MLS? So the best soccer players can go to any league in the world. And on the whole, they congregate in the leagues where the salaries are higher. So think Premier League or the best teams in Spain or Germany. 
And we reckon that MLS salaries are slightly below salaries in the Swiss League or the Belgian League. So you're not going to be able to get the best players with the salaries you're playing, you're paying. And that's partly because TV rights for the MLS are very low compared to the best European leagues. So you're about, I would guess, the 12th best league in the world or so. And you see that the best US players, the best Canadians, they go to the top European leagues. Think of Jonathan David, think of Alfonso Davies. And so I'm happy that there are big crowds and I'm sure MLS has improved over time, but this is not possibly not even a second tier league it is maybe a third tier league when an mls championship takes place does anybody in europe notice no <laughs> okay i was interested in your references in the book to the moneyball approach to soccer and i wonder if you feel it lends itself as a game to the same kind of statistical analysis as clearly has taken over baseball and even hockey to some extent there is a lot of statistical analysis going on these last 10 years in particular. And some clubs, you know, I would single out Brentford and Bryson in England and then Michelin's in Denmark have done well in identifying undervalued players and, you know, um, how to take a free kick, how to take a corner kick to the best statistical advantage. But it's still pretty marginal compared to baseball. I mean, statistical analysis really revolutionized baseball. You ended up with different players playing different strategies in soccer it's so far only made a marginal difference it's really been very disappointing and one of the problems is that for 88 89 minutes a game a player doesn't have the ball and it's very important to know what is he doing in the 89 minutes he doesn't have the ball well, it's very hard for statistical analysis to understand that so far well let me do a follow-up on the analytics question because i was really interested in your uh, references to the ownership of the boston red sox of major league baseball this is john henry who bought himself a team 12 years ago, bought Liverpool, wanted to bring the same kind of analytics approach that he brought to the Red Sox and won four titles there to Liverpool. How much success has he had importing that kind of approach to his soccer empire? They recruited people with PhDs from top universities and subjects like astrophysics to do player analysis, and they claim that that helped them identify the somewhat undervalued Egyptian striker Mo Salah, bring him to Liverpool, help them identify Jurgen Klopp as Liverpool coach. We're skeptical. I mean, in soccer economics, we do this analysis of how well do clubs relative to their spending on salaries and transfers. And Liverpool does moderately well, but actually the standout team in, in England for outperforming their, their spending is Tottenham. So I'd be very curious to know what Tottenham are doing because they're suddenly doing something, it seems, more advanced than Liverpool. So I'm skeptical that analytics has been as good for Liverpool as it ha has been for the Boston Red Sox. Understood. Well, it clearly hasn't. The Red Sox have got four World Series titles this century. And how many has Liverpool got? Well, at least they won the Champions League. And I don't think the Red Sox have won the Champions League. No, that's a fair point. Okay. I want to ask you about women's soccer, because uh, in particular in Canada, the most famous player, I think, in the history of soccer in this country is a woman, Christine Sinclair. And I was interested to read in your book that women's soccer was banned for decades even here in Canada. What's the story there? I mean, it's amazing to reflect on now, but around 1920, after World War I, during and after World War I, women's teams became very popular in England. And there was one in particular, the Dick Kerr Ladies, started out as a factory team. And by the end of World War I, they're drawing crowds of 50,000, and they're playing excellent football, they're hugely respected. And when the men come back from war, the English Football Association says, this women's soccer is a threat, we're going to ban it. And so they forbid any club that's attached to the Football Association, which means all clubs in England, from letting women play on their fields. So from about 1921, for 50 years, women's teams in England, Canada, and many other leagues, you know, the ban approximately 50 years in most of these countries, cannot play on regular sports fields. And so they can only, you know, play on in parks, uh, using sweaters for goalposts. And so what we argue in soconomics is that men's soccer owes women's soccer reparations, because why is women's soccer now behind men's soccer? It's because of this 50-year ban. It's because they were denied the opportunity to play, the resources, the ability to build women's teams with well-known names that would have, you know, histories of support like you get in men's soccer. And so it's really scandalous what men's soccer did and it's time to pay reparations uh, reparations in what form how would that work 
Well, I mean, our cautious estimate would be that it would be many tens of billions due, given the restraints of trade, illegally discriminatory, that was in place for 50 years. But what you'd want is very large sums of money transferred from men's soccer, which obviously generates huge amounts of money in television revenues, in ticket sales, sponsorship, and use that money to create facilities and training and places where girls can play, where women can play, so that women's soccer can quickly get back to where the way it should have been, which is parity with men's soccer in terms of interest, attention, skill levels, and number of players. How much embracing of that idea have you found uh, in your travels? Well, Soconomics is just out with this argument, so uh, I'm sure that when people read it, they will be totally convinced and all these reparations <laughs> will come streaming in. It's really, most importantly, a way for people to think about the damage that was done and how we need to start redressing it right now. Right. Okay, let's, you know, the first edition of, of this book, Soconomics, came out 13 years ago, and you know, if, if we use baseball as an example, there have been a lot of changes in baseball over the last 13 years, very few of them good. And I wonder if we could do the same kind of comparison for soccer. What are the biggest changes over the 13 years, and have they improved or not improved the game? I would say that soccer is, like baseball in a way, it's quite a traditional sport, and so it's quite stable. So you always have pretty much the same teams playing in the same cities, which you don't get in American Major League sports. The rules barely change. You know, there has been, I think 13 years ago, we thought, people thought that the North American leagues, the Japanese league, the Chinese league would come up and start buying really good players and challenge Western Europeans. That hasn't happened. The Western Europeans have become, if if possible, even more dominant in terms of they have the best leagues, but they also have the best national teams. They've just found the best way to play soccer and all other continents trail that. So I think the trend the last 13 years is Western European soccer dominance has become extreme. And otherwise, the game has remained, you know, very, very similar to what it was. There was an attempt at revolution last year by the owners creating a super league, the owners of the 12 biggest clubs. And due to fan outrage, that failed. So there's a kind of, I think, very healthy conservatism in soccer that stops radical change. And there's an issue of, if it ain't broke, why fix it? You know, <laughs> this is the most popular sport in the world. Well, it is interesting that in the nearly 100 years that the World Cup's been around, I think only eight countries have won uh, in a game that is played in dozens and, do well, hundreds of countries around the world. Why do you think that is? I think it's because the Western Europeans and less so recently the South Americans, the Southern South Americans, have found out how to train kids and how to play the best soccer. So here in Western Europe, you know, I see it in my, my children in Paris, from the age of six, you're learning how to make passing triangles, you're learning how to close down space when the other team has the ball, you're learning how to think soccer. Soccer is geometry, and it's very important to understand that. And then Brazil and Argentina are the only countries in the world that rival now, sort of the last 70 years, the Western Europeans. They produce the best players, the best individuals, the best dribblers. Uh, think of Leo Messi, think of Neymar, who are better than any European player. And so all the rest of the world has begun to play but not begun to play well. Hmm. You have a chapter in the book called Why Hosting the World Cup is Good for You. And given that this country is going to be hosting it in four years' time, I think our viewers and listeners would be interested to know why you think this will be good for us. Well, it'd be good for you. And partly, I think you already have all the facilities you need. You're not going to be doing a lot of uh, building of stadiums that become pointless white elephants two days after the tournament, which is what South Africa did, what Brazil did. So you have the facilities, and what this World Cup does is it brings a country together. It gives everyone in Canada during those weeks something to talk about, something to share with others, and that kind of communal conversation we kind of lost sort of with the decline of national television. You know, when I was a kid, everyone would watch the same program the night before, and you could talk about it at school, the office the next day. We don't have that anymore. And with the World Cup, you get that back again. So you have a shared national conversation which draws lonely people into you know, society, which is very important for the loneliest among us. And so we show in economics that in European countries, when the country is playing in a World Cup, suicides in that country decline. When a country is hosting a World Cup, uh, self-reported national happiness rises. So these are very important events for communal happiness. And I think you Canadians will discover this yourselves in 2026. Okay, having said that, the games are in, um, the World Cup, excuse me, is in Qatar this year. 
And, uh, you know, there's been a ton of controversy surrounding this uh, about the, um, the ethics that have been pursued in Qatar in getting the games. You wrote a piece for the Financial Times, your newspaper, called The Ethical Case for Watching This Possibly Unethical World Cup. What's the case you're making? I'm saying that World Cups bring enormous happiness to millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world, including people who have very difficult lives. And so it's a shared, not just a national journey, but it's a shared international moment where, you know, whether you live in Kiev or Moscow, or you live in Winnipeg or in Wagadu, you have something in common. So it unites the globe, it brings great happiness. And specifically vis-a-vis -vis Qatar, Qatar, you know, treads on the human rights of migrants, of women, of LGBTQ people. And we should be talking about that every single day. Sports washing works if we stop talking about the abuses. And because the World Cup is in Qatar, there's been an immense attention on the bad things that happened there. And that is embarrassed Qatar, which needs Western friends. Qatar fears its neighbor, Saudi Arabia, Iran. It wants us as friends. It cares what we think about it. And so in response to international pressure, which only happened because this tiny country got the World Cup, Qatar has been forced to improve its legislation for migrants, not nearly enough, and it's not uh, mostly enforced yet. But this engagement has achieved something. Amnesty International will tell you that. The International Trade Union Congress will tell you that. So just by watching with a conscience, watching and talking about the abuses in Qatar, but also enjoying the soccer, I think we do most to improve the loss of migrants and also you know, make humanity a little bit happier in years that have not been easy for many people. Understood. Okay, in our remaining moments here, let's get you on the record with your World Cup predictions. This is Canada's first trip to the World Cup in 36 years. How far do you think this country can go? Firstly, my predictions are always wrong. <laughs> now, you're in a group with Morocco, not a historically strong country, and with Croatia and Belgium, which have been very strong in recent years. But, you know, the Belgians, their great generation, they had about 10 or 12 wonderful players, sort of almost by chance, all grew up together, but now those guys are waning. The last two still in their peak are Thibaut Courtois and Kevin De Bruyne. The rest are old. So you're playing against an old Belgium, not the Belgium of four years ago. Croatia, similarly, you know, their star player, Luka Modric, still wonderful, 37 years old. The Croatian generation that reached the last World Cup final, also largely on the way out. So in that sense, you haven't been totally unlucky with who you're playing against. It's, it's the right moment, I think, to play Croatia, Belgium. It will still be a stretch for Canada to reach the second round, but I, I wouldn't be amazed if you do that. Well, I've heard some people are so despondent about things right now, they're wondering if we're even going to score a goal, let alone win a game. You think we're going to score a goal? My bet is that you will score a goal, yes. Don't okay. hold me to that. <laughs> okay, good enough. We note that England just won the Cricket World Cup. Can they win the Soccer World Cup? It's possible. I mean, I would put the chances at, say, 1 in 15, 1 in 10. That's that's not bad. England have a strong side. They've been poor in recent months. But, yeah, they, they absolutely could do it. Messi or Ronaldo? Who has the better World Cup? Messi. I mean, Messi is two years younger. Ronaldo is a little bit clapped out at this point. And Messi always was the better player. I mean, Ronaldo is a brilliant player, and Messi is better. Hmm. Uh, OK, I guess I should leave the uh, ultimate question to last. Who wins? In my dreams of the Netherlands, I grew up in Holland. In real life, I wouldn't discount France where I live now. People are, everyone's tipping Brazil, Argentina, so I'm gonna tip France. France it is, okay. And I guess, I know you're scrupulously neutral when you cover soccer, but you never did actually tell us who your favorite team is in your home and native land. Who, whom do you love? I grew up in the Netherlands really supporting all Dutch teams when they played in Europe, but especially supporting the national team. So the team that, does it for me most of all is the Dutch national team, who thankfully will be back in this World Cup after a four year absence. So, uh, hope Holland, uh, I'm very, very much supporting Holland. Well, good luck to them, if only to make you happy, and uh, not to mention uh, a few million people in the Netherlands as well. Simon, it's awfully good of you to spend some time with us on TVO tonight. We remind people your book is called Soccernomics Why European Men and American Women Win and Billionaire Owners Are Destined to Lose. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.
anyone encountering the health care system right now knows that it's spread thin and just barely staving off crisis. A new report from the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto adds to that picture, saying we need a major overhaul of Canada's primary care system. Sarah Allen is the lead researcher on the report and an associate professor at the U of T, and she joins us now in studio. And it's a delight to welcome you to our studio. Thank you so much. Because you've been on this program before, but always online. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to see you in person. Okay, let's do this. Oh, first of all, in the interest of full disclosure, my wife is a health policy consultant. She's never done work with your institute before. She never, uh, you don't know her, but uh, some of the issues we're talking about here today she is, I gather, peripherally involved in, and so we put that out there in, in the interest of full disclosure. Let me list a few of the key findings that are in your report, and then we're going to go do a deeper dive on each of them. For example, you want primary care in this province overhauled. You want multidisciplinary, team-based approaches to how we do health care, and you want a pan-Canadian health data strategy. Am I on the right track so far? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's dive into each one. Primary care reform. What do we need to do about that? Well, this report looked at the whole health system and we looked at it from the lens of both sustainability, so how can we ensure that it continues to provide good quality care to improve our population's health in the long run, but also resilience. So how able are we to withstand shocks, to recover from them, to adapt and learn? And at the core of both of those things is a strong primary care system that can help to sort of achieve both sustainability and resilience. And it's an area where Canada falls short. So there's been a lot of attention in the past you know, few years as we've gone through the pandemic on lots of failings in the system. And one of the ways that we can address many, but you know, not, not everything, but it's, it's really at the core, is, is strengthening primary care, ensuring that people have access to that first point of contact when they need it. And that basically means everybody getting to see a family doc. Everyone should be able to see a primary care provider. Yeah. And whether that's a family doc or a nurse practitioner mm -hmm. or someone else on the team. So you feel like your, your needs are met, you're supported, whether it's daytime or night. Um, you don't need to go to the ER. And then you're followed through the system as you age, as you encounter urgent and complex conditions, and your family as well can be cared for. So there's a fundamental sort of restructuring of our system that is needed to just allow for that sort of basic um, piece of the health system. I have to tell you, I've heard, and, and your report will be one of many that has made this point over the last many decades. Why do we still seem to be so far away from the promised land on this? Yes, I, it's a great question, and much of the report that we've produced is it's not going to be new or shocking or uh, surprising to anyone, but it's important to look at it now as we're recovering from a pandemic and to keep trying to push towards change. And as you say, it's very difficult. So we know that uh, there's been a lot of investment in the early 2000s in primary care. So all the governments in Canada agreed that we're going to invest more and we did. We spent more on primary care providers. We've increased the number of nurses and doctors. However, we haven't really changed the way they're working. And there's some models out there. In Ontario, we have some innovative team-based care models and elsewhere in Canada as well. And so there are some pockets where we see this change happening, but what we need to do is try and build on those to scale them, to support them, and to allow all providers who um, are working in primary care to be linked up with a team. So this is not necessarily a question of our not having enough doctors or nurse practitioners in our system. It's a question of how we employ them? I think it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both because when we look at comparative data across other high income countries, we do see that there are fewer doctors per per capita, so you know, adjusted for population size in Canada than many other countries and it's below the average for OECD, so it's a group of high income countries. And so we know that we're a little bit below the average, which means we might need more people. We also know that there's a distribution problem. So we have a, lot, a concentration of providers in urban centers, not as many outside. 
Um, but we also are experiencing higher rates of retirement, high vacancy rates, obviously burnout is a major issue. So it's both, we need more, but we also need to support the change in the way we practice and the way we, we, we sort of structure the system. And so that involves linking up providers in a team and ensuring that they're connected with other parts of the system. Tell me if this is an issue, because I have heard this anecdotally, but you've done an official study, so you know, you'll know, whereas my stuff's just stories. I have heard that unlike doctors of, say, 50 years ago, who, who, who were married to the job and were content to work 80 and 90 hour weeks uh, and never see their families and, and have you know, very unbalanced lives, that doctors coming out of medical school today don't want that. They want more balanced lives. And what it means is it's harder for their patients to get in to see them because they're simply not keeping as many office hours as doctors of a generation or two ago. True or false? Well, there's not a lot of evidence to back that anecdotal sort of experience up. However, there are changes in the way people are practicing that uh, we need to consider. So for example, uh, the types of um, business, small businesses that perhaps physicians in the previous generations were used to having to set up that might not be desirable anymore. For example, we, don't, we might not want to have to you know, worry about being a small business owner, whereas if you join a team that's already established, you have the supports, the admin staff, you don't need to worry about hiring and the stress of, of sort of being a small business owner, those might, you know, there might be a, a sort of shift away from that. And so given that there's a desire to both have work-life balance, but also be supported in your work environment and not be alone, uh, you know, responsible for a team, then you could be linked up with a, with a broader team. So we know that there is some supports that come with team-based care, for example, that allow people to sort of move into their practice with supports, with allied professions that they can refer their patients to, for example, pharmacists, social workers, dietitians, to meet the needs of their patients without having to do it all themselves. Gotcha. I want to put something to you that Sylvia Jones, the health minister, sort of famously said not too long ago. She said, after decades of inaction, we can no longer stand by and support a status quo that cannot respond to the current challenges the sector is facing. What did you take that to mean? I think it's really uh, important to think about the, the, the challenge with bringing about change. So yes, we have been in a fairly static mode for many decades. So the Canadian health system looks really similar to uh, how it was originally constructed in the 1960s when we sort of started to pay for things collectively in, in a universal way. So universal health coverage was established as a great achievement in Canada. And we've you know, improved quality, we have a robust workforce that's really well trained, but we haven't really changed the dynamic of how care is delivered recognizing that we're older, that we have complex health and social needs. And so I agree that we, we need to change things. And so- The question is how? The question is how. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we have examples of how change can happen and providers and health, health organizations and, and the health workforce are highly skilled and they need to be supported to be able to do their work. So supported with, you know, funds and mm -hmm. staff and teammates, but also with data and information systems, and those are the sort of things that governments can do to help them to do their best. Can I make one recommendation? Yes. That I don't know if this is in your report. <laughs> Sometimes I'm told doctors still use fax machines to send information to pharmacies about getting their patients prescription medicine, or fax machines to diagnostic clinics in order to get the requests in for their patients to get you know, an MRI or an X-ray or whatever. How in 2022 are we still using fax machines to communicate within our healthcare system? It's true. I'm not it's wrong about sad, this. It's a sad, it's a sad yeah. fact. Um, I, it, it is true, and we've we see it um, more and more infrequently. But it is one of the few. I think it's probably the only industry that still uses the fax machine. Um, but data and our lack of data, both for people as you know as patients and to be able to access that but also for providers to be able to share the information that they're getting lab tests and referrals and prescriptions this is not integrated it's not following the patient it's this is um, you know an area where Canada really is lagging compared to other countries 
And so one of the recommendations in the report is really to advance this. So we need to both improve the, the interoperability so mm -hmm. data can speak to each other across hospitals, primary care, labs, et cetera, but also that we need to ensure that the data are being provided back to health organizations, providers, in a way that's comparable so they can see where they're doing well, where they're need to, needing to improve. And how can we track that at a Canadian level? Because people move across the country. You know, mm -hmm. we're residents of Canada, and it would be really nice if that you know data systems could actually speak to each other across provinces as well. In our last minute here, I want to ask you about the. the uh, I, I think what one of the main problems is in healthcare today, and that's access. People can't get access to doctors or tests in a timely fashion. They got to go to the ER too often for stuff that's not emergent, uh, uh, of an urgent nature rather. What do you want to do to improve access to healthcare in this, in this province and in this country? We need more people. We need to support them better. And so we need to pay them uh, you know, enough to, to keep them in their jobs. We need to leverage all of the different workers that we have, both in Canada and those newly coming to the country and ensure that they're able to work um, even they've, if they've been trained elsewhere. So building up the and supporting the workforce is essential. And then I think primary care reform in terms of allowing doctors and nurses and other providers to work in a team to provide that wraparound care during the day and at night um, and linking with the other parts of the system. These are the, some of the areas that I think will make a dent in improving access. Um, there's 29 or so recommendations in the report, mm -hmm. and if we follow all of them, then I know that we would be able to address uh, wait times and access problems in Canada. What's the price tag on those 29 recommendations? It's uh, not possible to put a number, but I think we do need to spend more. I mean, we spent more in the pandemic. We saw that we could, you know, shore up some additional funds and the federal government stepped in. I think they will again. And I think we'll get out of this crisis with investment, but also with reform. Problem is people want a Cadillac, but they only want to pay for a Chevy. That's the problem. <laughs> Anyways, I'm pontificating too much. Sarah Allen from the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the U of T. Really good of you to come in tonight and help us out with this. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. The inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act to end the convoy protests wraps this week. Tomorrow, J.N. Jagannathan checks in on what we've learned so far. Also, are you sure those group of seven paintings are real or might they be fakes? We'll dive into that mystery. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.